People come to my office and they come to Pastor Jim's office and they say things like, my life is messed up and I need you to fix it. And then they proceed to share all the problems and all the broken pieces and they want to know how all this can be put back together. Sometimes the problems are relationships, sometimes the problems are habits, sometimes they are money problems, sometimes they're physical problems, but you get the picture. Now, we don't we're not judgmental or nor are we nor are we complaining about that when when people do their concerns and and uh, dump these areas and problems on us but often it's it's implied or said okay what are you going to do about it what's the answer and we often say well what you really need is Jesus Christ or what you really need to do is to be obedient to the word of God or what you really need to do is to please Jesus first. By the way, it's a very good word for being number one, all right? Um, that probably, that's probably not what they were expecting to hear, and probably not what they really wanted to hear. It probably sounds way too simplistic. It sort of sounds like the same cure for whatever the problem. It sort of sounds like the pastor's version of take two aspirin and call me in the morning. Now, are those empty words, are, are those empty, empty cliches that are just kind of spouted off by naive counselors who have no idea about the complexities of life? What do you think? I mean, for us to say, ultimately, what you really need is Jesus, what you really need is to understand the sufficiency of who he is and draw upon those resources, is that, is that pie in the sky? Is that silliness? Is that... Is that just way too simplistic? I mean, if you have problems and you come to me, I will probably listen to what you have to say, and I'll, I'll try to help you deal with those issues. I, I may give you some practical steps to take. I, I may suggest that there are some changes that you need to make. Um, but frankly, most of our real problems are spiritual problems, and they result from trying to live our lives apart from God. Many of the problems that we have are probably more symptomatic or consequences of failing really to see Jesus Christ as preeminent. Now that's a big word. You know the word preeminent basically means first. That recognizes Jesus as first in our life. Now the simple definition for preeminent is first. If Jesus is first, the difficulties in my life by definition, cannot be anything more than second. Now, usually we pile, all oh, these things are so big and so enormous and overwhelming and I feel like I'm, I, I can't deal with, but if Jesus is first, everything else is below that. If he's first, the difficulties in my life can't be more than second. The things that are second are behind what is first. Duh. Duh. When I have problems with my kids, or problems with my wife, or problems with my neighbors, or problems with my coworkers, or problems with a classmate at school, at least part of the problem is my failure to respond appropriately to what God has said in his word. And that really boils down to obeying Christ as he exercises his control over my life. Preeminent's a big word, and it means first, and what it's really saying is Jesus is first, and, and if he's not first, then something else is squeezed ahead of him. Now you might say, wait a minute. I mean, maybe you have a serious disease, or maybe you have bad knees, or maybe you have the flu. How could acknowledging Jesus as first make any difference than those things? And while the problem or the pain might remain... If we recognize Jesus' preeminence in our life, at least the way we see the problem will be different. How? Well, we will recognize that his grace is enough and will stop feeling shortchanged by what we might think to be his indifference or his inability to help. Sometimes we get the idea, apparently God doesn't care about me because look at the mess I'm in. Does he care? Or apparently he's not able to help me. Is he? 
And whatever the problem, remember that if he's first, at best the problem can only be second. It can't be all-consuming. Now, as you know, Paul's letter to the Colossians is about many things. These believers were being tempted to blend philosophy in rigid discipline and some mystical knowledge all put together to try to solve their problems. Paul reminded them that these things don't really help. He's saying, whatever you need, Jesus is able to meet that need. In other words, if you have Jesus, you have all you need. If Jesus is first in our life, then we will discover that he is sufficient for whatever we lack. Now, that sounds almost too good to be true, but I'm reminded all the way back in the Old Testament, I bet most of you could could recite this first phrase. You know it by heart. You've known it since you were a little kid. The Lord is my, and I shall want. Now, the word want is the word to be in lack. And, and so the idea would be, if the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want, or I shall not want for anything, or I shall not lack. So if the Lord is my shepherd, then I don't lack for anything, therefore he is all I need. And we've been saying that our whole life. And yet when the problems come along, oh, they're overwhelmed. No, well, you know, the Lord, if the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He really is all we need. Now, Jesus is first, but sometimes we substitute other things to be first. So Paul had to set his readers straight. And he tells us about the substitutes that we put in there that crowd him out, as it were, so that he's no longer first in our lives. I mean, he's still first, but we don't acknowledge that. The first substitute I would talk about is simply, and this is a hard one to get your hand around, but things, <laughs> stuff, all right? L listen to what he says in chapter 1. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, invisible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be, and here's that big word, preeminent. So let's talk about the problem of things. We're often distracted by things. I don't know of any other place, any other uh, statement I've read that helps me put a handle on that any better than A.W. Tozer in his book, The Pursuit of God. He says this, before the Lord God made man upon the earth, he first prepared for him a world of useful and pleasant things for his sustenance and delight. In the Genesis account, there are, they are simply called things. They were made for man's use, but they were meant always to be external to the man and subservient to him. In the deep heart of man was a shrine where none but God was worthy to come. Within him was God, without a thousand gifts which God had showered upon him. But sin has introduced complications and has made those very gifts of God a potential source of ruin to his soul. Our woes began when God was forced out of his central shrine and things were allowed to enter. Within the human heart, things have taken over. Men have now by nature no peace within their hearts, for God is crowned there no longer. There is within the human heart a tough, fibrous root of fallen life whose nature is to possess, always to possess. It covets things with a deep and fierce passion. The pronouns my and mine look innocent enough in print, but their constant and universal use is significant. The root of our hearts have grown down into things, and we dare not pull up one rootlet lest we die. Things have become necessary to us. A development never originally intended. God's gifts now take the place of God, and the whole course of nature is upset by this monstrous substitution. Things and stuff have a way of consuming our thoughts and our energies to the point that we, are complete, we completely forget God and his priorities. 
most of us here love God. I think if we, if we really look at each other, we, we, we love God. We, we, we love him. We love what he's done for us. We, we love God. We're grateful for the salvation that God has given. We care about his word and we want to be with his people and we know how important it is to talk to him. But surprisingly enough, days can pass with very little thought for God, very little conversation with God. Do you understand the tyranny of things? God created these things, though, didn't he? I mean, so if he created all, then why is it that things are in tension with our relationship with God? Paul said, by him, all things were created. Somehow we've managed to push him aside and worship and serve things more than the one who made all those things. As subtle as it seems, that's a, that's a terrible offense to God. One writer wrote this, the created universe is all about glory. The deepest longing of the human heart and the deepest meaning of heaven and earth are summed up in this, the glory of God. The universe was made to show it, and we were made to see it and savor it. Nothing less will do, which is why the world is distorted and as dysfunctional as it is. We have exchanged the glory of God for other things. If, if things is a problem, then what was the purpose for things? Why did God make these things anyway? In chapter 1, verse 16, again, listen to what the scripture says. All things were created by him and for him. Now, perhaps that's the part we miss. I think we get the idea that all things were created for us. <laughs> now, it's, we've been given these things to enjoy, but basically they were made by God, by him and for him. We have the whole created universe entrusted to us to watch over, to use, and to manage but we are to use it to satisfy what? Not our selfish desires. God created the heavens and the earth and all that are in them that they might shout his glory. That's why the Bible says all of this about Jesus and then says so that in everything he might have the supremacy or the preeminence or the first place in our life. When we look at God's creation, it's appropriate to marvel its beauty. But we can't stop there. The creation is saying, look at him. Give him glory. Creation exists to point to him. And by the way, we are a part of his creation. And so our responsibility is to point to him. Glory to God. That's the perspective. And when we acknowledge that Christ is preeminent or first, we have all things to enjoy, and when we deny Jesus' first place, we ultimately lose everything. It was Tozer who said this, Everything is safe which we commit to him, and nothing is really safe which is not so committed. Things distract. And so we have to be careful not to allow that to happen. He made everything for himself, for his own pleasure, that all of his creation might praise him. So Paul says that Jesus is first over all the things and stuff he has created. So much for things. Perhaps more specifically, one of the major substitutes trying to push Jesus out of that first place would be me. Okay? Just me. Some of you look at me like, oh, you're the problem, huh? <laughs> Listen to what he says in chapter 2. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. And you who were dead in your trespasses, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with all of its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Now we need to talk about this idea of power or authority. There is a desire for power. Everybody seems to have that. People want to control. They want power. They want authority. They want to be in charge. Now, it can be in the office. It can be on the playground. 
even if we are not in control, we say things like this. Boy, if I was the boss, or if I was the pastor, or if I was the teacher, or if I was the captain, or whatever, I would do that. In our delusion, we somehow have figured out that if we were in control, everything would be great. What if you had absolute authority? That's a scary thought, isn't it? I mean, not only would not everything be great, it's possible that everything would be a lot worse. <laughs> well, let's see if we can learn a lesson about power. Depending on the translation, we learn about the power of God in Colossians. In fact, in, fact, in chapter 2, verse 10, uh, the scripture says, it depends on the translation, the word that's used, or how it's translated, but Christ is the head over every power. You may have rule, but it's the same word. Christ is the head over every power or rule and authority, verse 10. Verse 12 says, you were raised with him through your faith in the power or powerful working of God. Verse 15, Christ disarmed the powers or rulers and authorities. That takes a lot of power. It takes a lot of power to overthrow those who are in power. But that's the picture of Jesus. Now here's the lesson. Jesus is head over every authority. He's the head over every power, including my power, my authority. And by the way, I was not only powerless. The Bible says that I was dead in my sin. I was captive, a prisoner held by Satan. I was in spiritual debt up to my eyeballs. Actually, over a little deeper than that, okay? I was underwater, okay? On my own, there was no way out. But Christ humbled himself. He died on the cross. He disarmed and made a spectacle of every power and authority. He set me free from sin and death. And while he was at it, he canceled my debt and gave me the riches of his righteousness. That'll be worth something, right? Is that a good news? Okay, I appreciate hearing that because I want to make sure you guys are awake. And I mean, when I think about the idea of my debt and my sin and my failures and my wrongs, and Jesus took all of that away and gave me his righteousness, if we cannot respond in praise to him for that, we are dead. Okay? He's done all of that for us. He could do that because he is God and all the fullness of God dwells in him bodily. Christ was totally triumphant over all. He demonstrated that he is preeminent over everything. He won. He's first. And since he's done all of that, conquering sin and death, who am I to think I have a better idea or that I could, I could somehow step into his shoes? To deny God authority over me and to do my own thing is arrogant not to mention ignorant. To yield to Christ's authority who has made us alive and forgiven our sins is the only response that makes any sense. If you are refusing to yield to his authority, you're playing the part of a fool. For he has conquered sin and he's called us to yield to him. Jesus is first over things. He made them. He owns them. He's first over me. He made me. He saved me, and he owns me. He's first. And I need to get that into my head. But that might be a problem. Because not only am I a problem, my brain and my thinking are sometimes a problem. And you can change the word to you also, okay? Um, we struggle with that issue. Listen to what Paul said in verses 1 through 4 and 12 through 17 of chapter 3. If then you have been raised with Christ... Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one is complaint, a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. And above all these things, put on love that binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body. And be thankful. 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to God, and whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I'm not sure why, but we may, have, uh, we may reason that we don't need to yield to God's authority. We either think that we can't live that kind of life that God is calling us to, so why bother? Or we're not sure we want to. Or both. We reason in our little brain, I'll never be perfect this side of heaven. I'm going to make mistakes. I know God will forgive. I'll go to heaven when I die. So for now, I'm just going to chill out and enjoy life. Okay, Do whatever I want. Look out for number one. Paul says, wait a minute, God has something to say about that. And then God begins to make an adjustment in our thinking. Isn't it amazing? He transforms our minds. Isn't that great? He changes. To transform something is to make something come out of what's there so that what results is different than what you started with, okay? So your little caterpillar brain becomes a beautiful butterfly as God begins to transform that. Um, he makes an adjustment in our thinking. While we live down here, we are to think up there. It's time to have a spiritual perspective on what we do. If Jesus is first in our life, we're not missing out on anything here. We're living a life to its fullness in anticipation of his presence. Have you ever noticed how we act? When we're wronged, you know what we want to do? Retaliate. You've seen those bumper stickers? I don't get even, I get revenge. I always want to bump into those people. I don't know. <laughs> when we're not noticed, we sit on the pity pot. If we're not appreciated like we think we ought to be, we complain. We whine, we cry. If we don't get our way, we quit or make everybody else wish we would quit. How significant are those things in light of God and heaven? As we start to set our mind on God, he adjusts our thinking about what's really important. And as he adjusts our thinking, he makes a correction in our perspective. The new perspective calls us to put some things off and to put some other things on. If you want to, you can read what we are to uh, throw away in verses 8 and 9 of chapter 3. I already read what we are to put on in verses 12 through 14 of chapter 3. And the reason why we can do those things is because Jesus is first. See, if he's in control, moving me in the direction I ought to go, then I can put those things away and put those other things on. If he's not in that place of authority in my life, I don't want to put those things away or put those other things on, sorry. Um, and what I'm discovering is that the scripture says he has provided for us all that we need, all that we need for life and godliness. It's possible to do what he has commanded us to do. Will we sometimes fail? No doubt. Will we sometimes uh, fail to act in a loving, kind manner? Most likely. But we will make progress. Once again, remember that he has changed us. Some major adjustments have been made. We can live to please him. It all rests on whether or not we recognize the preeminence of Jesus in our life. So when Jesus is first, he really is all we need, really. Really. He will take the burdens, and he'll lighten the load. He'll mend our broken hearts. He'll change our lives. Substitutes don't cut it here. Things and stuff can't be first in our life. They weren't made for that. I can't be first in my life either. I don't have the power or authority. I can try to convince myself and my own thinking that I'm, I can somehow pull it off, but I'm kidding myself. He's first. That's the reality. And that's good because he has conquered the power of sin in our lives. He's reconciled us to himself. 
And he has begun the process of teaching us that he is preeminent, first in everything. And when I finally get that, finally gets burned in this brain, a whole lot of problems and issues of life, if not settled, they are lessened. When I know that Jesus is right, the problems of my life suddenly take a different position. They aren't first. They aren't overwhelming because he's there. And if you're looking for the last statement of this message, guys, here it is. He is first. And that is great news. All right? I'm going to close in prayer in just a moment. Um, I'm actually going to, the words are not mine, but the heart is, okay? From somebody else who, who wrote the sentiment that's on my heart now, I'm going to use that to pray. And then just a reminder that after we sing and after the benediction is given, if we can help you in some way, some of the folks in our church can pray with you, please avail yourself to the prayer corner. Let's pray. Father of glory, this is the cry of our hearts, to be changed from one degree of glory to another until in the resurrection at the last trumpet we will be completely conformed to the image of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, until then we long to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus, especially the knowledge of his glory. We want to see him as clearly as we can see the sun. We want to savor him as deeply as our most desired pleasure. Dear merciful God, incline our hearts to your, to your word and the wonders of your glory. Wean us from our obsession with trivial things. Open the eyes of our hearts to see each day what the created universe is telling us about your glory. Enlighten your, our minds to see the glory of your Son in the gospel. We believe that you are the all-glorious one and that there is none like you. Dear God, help, uh, help our unbelief. Forgive the wandering of our affections and the undue attention we give to lesser things. Have mercy on us for Christ's sake and fulfill in us your great design to display the glory of your grace. In Jesus' all-powerful, preeminent name we pray.